Hi. What you up to? I'm uh, just about to film the review. Why? What's up? Uh huh. And uh, what's on the table this week? Oh, <laughs> I mean, you know what movie it is. Uh. No, no, I, I, I can't, I can't remember. Can, can you tell me? Oh, pff, yeah. Pff. It's um, Dracula 2000. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. What, what, what movie are we reviewing this week? Huh? Oh, uh, it's, it's a Dracula 2000. Dracula 2000. That's okay. Right, look, what do you want? You're gonna make a good movie. movie. It ties in another with the religion Dracula theme. You're gonna make what? me edit another it's Dracula It's not the same, okay? Are you kidding me? It's a sequel. Haven't you had it's a continuation. Enough. You have it's a, a different movie. Okay. There were different people in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I promise. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's, it's way different. different. Okay, different. just let me explain. Dracula 2000 was released in 2000, and it was released by Dimension Films. It was directed by Patrick Lessier and was written by him and Joel Soisen. I didn't pronounce either of those names right. I apologize. I can't read. This movie stars Gerard Butler, Johnny Lee Miller, Justine Waddell, and also features Christopher Plummer, Jennifer Esposito, Omar Epps, and so many other amazing talents. It's this, ooh, this movie is just teeming with early 2000s goodness. I am so excited to talk about this movie and give it the love that it deserves because if you look at a lot of online reviews, they are mediocre to negative. This movie only has a 17% on Rotten Tomatoes, which makes me sad because some people will look at that and go, nah, not even worth my time. No, this movie is worth your time and I am going to tell you why. Dracula 2000 is the first in a trilogy of movies. We don't know how, you know, structured this trilogy is. I've only seen the first one and part of the second one. And these are commonly known as the Wes Craven Draculas. It says Wes Craven Presents on the start of every single one of these movies. With a big horror name like Wes Craven attached to this franchise, you'd think it would have done better. But no. Like I said, 17% for Dracula 2000 and the two sequels were direct-to-video releases. We'll cover those other two movies another time. Right now, let's just talk about Dracula 2000. If you are unfamiliar with the format of my videos, here's a brief rundown of how it's going to go. I will give you a brief spoiler-free summary of the movie, as well as a smattering of my thoughts, and then I will give this movie's MPAA rating and a score out of 5. I'll then give a little bit more in-depth analysis and breakdown of the plot for anybody who wants to stick around for that, anybody who doesn't want the movie spoiled with them and just wants to go watch it, I invite you to go do so, but anybody who wants to hear my thoughts, my rambles, stick around for that. Dracula 2000 would probably be considered a continuation of Stoker's novel, except in modern day. Dracula, after his spree in London in the 1800s, was captured and imprisoned, and after stupid criminals are stupid, he is unleashed on the modern world. Meanwhile, a woman in New Orleans named Mary Heller starts having very vivid nightmares of a very sexy stranger and copious amounts of blood. Could there be a connection between the mysterious coffin and the mysterious nightmares? Who knows? Find out in Dracula 2000. Oh my gosh, you guys, this movie is so much fun. Holy crap, I love this movie. And you know, I love a lot of movies, and I love movies for different reasons. This movie is just a good time to watch. It's it's so soaked in early 2000s culture from the costumes and of course of course it was made in this time period, but even the way that it's shot, the way that it's written, the things that it focuses on. This is such an early 2000s movie, so it comes in with that little punch of nostalgia for anybody who grew up in that time. So it's a lot of fun for that reason. Great trip down memory lane. It's also got a lot of really fun vampire action. There's a good amount of blood, there's a good amount of flipping and wire tricks and crawling on walls. There's some really cool vampire slaying gadgets. We love gadgets. Oh my goodness, we love gadgets. The acting is also really well done. I was honestly kind of surprised. For a movie that's this critically pounded into the sand as this movie is, you wouldn't expect the performances to be as good as they are. Omar Epps is hands down my favorite part of the movie. He is just 
a joy to watch. He looks like he's having so much fun in his role. And then of course, Gerard Butler is the sexiest Dracula that I've reviewed so far. I'm sorry, Frank Langella. Gerard Butler has you beat in this movie. He doesn't talk for like 75% of the movie, but he doesn't need to because he has a long black coat and really curly hair and no shirt on. I mean, that's, that's all a girl needs. I also really love Jennifer Esposito in this movie. She plays one of the secondary characters, but she also looks like she's just having fun with, with the things that she gets to do in this movie. I adore her in this. Nathan Fillion also shows up for like five seconds as a priest. So there's that for all you Nathan Fillion fans out there. I, I mean, who isn't a Nathan Fillion fan? We all love Nathan Fillion. Justine Waddell, Waddle, whatever is our main girl. She plays Mary Heller, and she's honestly kind of a badass in this. I mean, we see her vulnerable and more weak side towards the beginning, but when the cards are down, Mary kicks total trash. She is fantastic, and she's a really interesting character. I'll get into a little bit more of that in my analysis part of the video, but just know Mary, she'll take you out, man, and she won't apologize for it. I will say this movie does rely a little bit on jump scares, but it's the early 2000s who didn't, you know? So jump scare heavy movie, still a ton of fun. Go check it out. I highly recommend it. Dracula 2000 is rated R. There is some implied brief sauciness and a good amount of blood. This movie also gets a rating of four out of five. This is a this movie is a good time. It's just a lot of fun. Gerard Butler's fantastic in it. The supporting cast is all great. The setting is so much fun. New Orleans in the early 2000s, fantastic. Go check out this movie. I highly recommend it. Alrighty, this is the part of the video where the spoiler-free people, GTFO, and anyone who wants to hear my more in-depth thoughts on the movie, plus a little bit more about the plot itself, you guys can stick around and we'll talk that through. In three, two, one. The movie starts as the credits roll. We are on board the Demeter, the ship that is carrying Dracula to England in 1897. It's a nice little bloody scene. Everybody's dead. Fantastic. We also get some hints at what did this to the crew. I mean, we all know what did it, but like, it's nice to see it a little bit. Ah, it's so great. And it's a great way to open the movie, showing us familiar territory with those of us familiar with Dracula, while almost immediately yoinking us into the year 2000 in London. Yeah, we went from the ship, basically walked into London. It's fantastic. We start at Carfax Antiquities. That's another little ring back to Dracula. Carfax Abbey is where Dracula keeps his coffins in the book. Carfax Antiquity is where Van Helsing is keeping his coffin in 2000. Great callback. This movie, and this movie is so full of these little callbacks. And I'll point them out as we go along because they just excite my little Dracula heart. I love it. I love the little, just a little, we are introduced to Simon. Simon is the guy who works at this antiquity shop and he works with a man named Matthew Van Helsing, played by Christopher Plummer. Simon also has a thing for the other research assistant named Selena, who is played by Jennifer Esposito. Now, she shuts him down real quick because she's Jennifer Esposito and she can do better. We see that another reason she shut him down was because she is a friggin' criminal. She is going to rob this antique shop because she knows that Mr. Van Helsing has something secret locked in his basement. A group of criminals with the help of Selena break into the antiquity shop. They break into the vault and we get some good old 2000s nerd hacking. It's so funny to watch. I love 2000s nerd hacking. The deeper the thieves get into the vault, the more concerned they're becoming because there's not really anything there of value. Now, Selena told them that Van Helsing was like hiding some good stuff in that vault and they're not seeing it. There are just these weird skulls on the wall. There are old books and furniture. There's just like stuff. Everything's covered in cobwebs. There are crucifixes everywhere. Everything is covered in silver and iron. 
It's, they're like, where's the gold, Selena? Miss Esposito? What? Finally, they do come to the final room in the vault, which holds a giant silver coffin. This thing is what I want to be buried in. It looks so cool. It's like silver and covered in crosses and it's beautiful. And when you try to move it, spikes come out of the ceiling and impale every 2000s boyfriend ever. I don't even know his name. He just played every, every boyfriend and every 2000s movie and every ex-boyfriend and every 2000s Hallmark movie. I don't know his name. I apologize. Whoever you are editing me will give you a nice little tribute because you died immediately. And then the guy that <laughs> gets impaled on the door. <laughs> this movie. This movie is unintentionally hilarious at times, especially when it's trying to be too brutal in this first scene. So every 2000s boyfriend ever pushes the coffin off the platform so that they can like drag it away, but it triggers a pressure plate that brings a wall of spikes down onto the platform and impales every 2000s boyfriend ever and then one guy token asian native american ponytail guy tries to leave and he gets impaled on this like portcullis of uh, spikes that that comes down and it's very clearly a mannequin the next time we see it it's so funny so Omar Epps and Jennifer Esposito, I can't remember his character, I think it's Mark. Omar Epps and Jennifer Esposito blow a hole in the side of the wall and they, and the remaining two or three thieves get the coffin out and they escape. Van Helsing heard all the commotion, took him 67 years to get down to the vault because Christopher Plummer is like ancient, which is fair. So... <laughs> Remember the guy that got portcullis in the spikes, just the, the one that was obviously a mannequin? Christopher Plummer comes down and like lifts the portcullis back up. And so this dude's body just goes whoop and his like arm hangs down. Oh, it's so funny. I don't think it was supposed to be as funny as it was, but it was so funny. <laughs> Am I just messed up? So the coffin has been stolen and these thieves have their own plane for some reason. I'm not even gonna think too much about it. It's a great setting and it's a great replacement for the ship. So instead of a cargo ship, they're on a plane. Great change, I love it. I'm not gonna ask too many questions. Like why do they need to steal money from an old man if they have a plane of their own? I'm not gonna ask questions, this movie's fantastic. I ignore, ignore all the things that don't make sense. Ignore them, ignore them, get them out of your brain. So one of the thieves is trying to crack open the coffin and he's like really, really, he, he can't figure it out. So he, he ends up finding the way to open it, which again is another reason that I want this coffin so badly. It looks so pretty. And he opens up the coffin and he finds a corpse inside, but it's not a skeleton. It's got some juice left in it as he so clearly points out. And there are leeches that are covering this corpse. It's got a helmet on, a cross on its crotch. It's a crotch cross. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't ask questions, just enjoy the movie. Don't ask questions. So the guy ends up removing the crotch cross and he like tries to lift the body up to look for gold or something underneath it because the cross is made of silver beautiful so he's like cool more cool stuff under this corpse let me just touch it with my bare hands and not put on any gloves gross ew but it's fine because you know the body springs to life and eats him and it's fine it's fine we didn't need him <laughs> so the vampire is now awake and he goes about eating everybody on the plane and he saves jennifer esposito and omar epps for last because they're going to be the most important members of the thief group which like fair, I, 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 I'll watch them. I like them. And Gerard Butler just looks so sexy when he's fully regenerated, like <sighs> so good. I will not apologize. I will simp for him this entire video. 
I have I, I have no shame. I have no shame. This is also where we see that Jennifer Esposito, ugh, sorry, that's, that's too long. Selena becomes Dracula's first new bride. The plane then ends up crashing in New Orleans, in the bayou. So we're now in New Orleans. But before we dig too much into that new exciting uh, landscape, let's zoom on back to London real quick. Van Helsing discovers, of course, that the coffin is missing and he starts to pack up all of his stuff so that he can go chase Dracula. Simon shows up and is really concerned uh, for Van Helsing. He's like, you know, hey, what's going on? What happened? You know, why aren't there no guards outside? What, why is the vault open? And Van Helsing's like, look, the guards are fine. They didn't kill them for some reason, I, just to be nice, I guess. And he's like, something was stolen. Do not call the police. Let me handle this myself. I know I'm 75,000 years old and you love me as a father, but seriously, Simon, stay put. And Simon's like, okay, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. So Simon ends up following Van Helsing to New Orleans so they can chase the vampire. Throughout all of this, we've been getting flashes between Dracula and a woman named Mary. Now she works in New Orleans. And the store that she works at. <sighs> Is it a great sponsorship? Is it a heavy handed, hey, look at me reference? Maybe a bit of both. It has to be a bit of both. Virgin must have donated so much money to this movie because they're everywhere. <laughs> She's wearing a t-shirt with the Virgin logo. She works there. We see the store logo all the time. We see the store itself. It's so funny to me. <laughs> Maybe not to everybody else, but I love it. So Mary works at the Virgin store in New Orleans. And we see that she's a very nice Catholic girl. She wears her crucifix all the time. Her her best friend, she, she's best friends with a, the priest of her church, Nathan Fillion, we love. And she's much more kind of reserved than her roommate Lucy is. So Mary is having these nightmares and she's really concerned because her mother also had nightmares before she passed away. Mary is really worried that these nightmares are a sign that she's going insane and she doesn't want to go down that same dark path that she feels like her mom did. So we are now in New Orleans and there is a reporter, Laura, Jennifer, I don't know her name, I can't remember, it doesn't matter, reporter blonde reporter lady. She is out in the bayou covering the plane crash with her cameraman. And this is actually one of the coolest scenes in the movie. Again, don't think about it. I'm gonna turn off my vampire lore brain that knows that the only reason that vampires couldn't be seen in photographs was because they were developed using silver. We're fine. She is filming this uh, exclusive about the plane crash and her cameraman, you know, he's looking through the eyepiece of the camera, he has one eye closed, when all of a sudden she like goes rigid and she like starts gasping. And when he looks away from the camera, Gerard Butler is holding on to her and like cutting open her neck. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. I love this part. So she gets away and runs into the van, into the news van, and she closes herself in. And on the, on the monitors, she can see her cameraman being lifted into the air and like thrown all around like a rag doll and just tossed back and forth. It's so much fun. This scene is actually really, really scary and just, it's so much fun. It's so well done. But you can't hide from a vampire, so Gerard Butler rips his way into the van and news reporter lady becomes bride number two. While all of this is going on, the bodies from the plane crash have been taken to the small town hall and just like left there awaiting investigation or something. I don't know why. Ignore it. Ignore anything that doesn't make sense because this movie is amazing. Van Helsing arrives to dispatch the vampires and Simon shows up. And Van Helsing is like, bro, what are you doing here? I told you to stay in London. And Simon's like, 
you're stupid if you thought I was going to listen to you. Turns out Van Helsing was a little too slow and the bodies are already starting to wake up. Where we get a lot of fun vampire fighting in the scene. We get people flying over banisters, Christopher Plummer being, you know, picked up and thrown, which like, be nice to him. We love Christopher Plummer, okay? Put him down, damn it. And we get one of my favorite scenes. Omar Epps wakes up as a vampire. He's so much fun. And Simon tries to get him before he can get him. And Omar Epps like grabs him and pins him down and is like laughing at him and he's like, ah, I'm gonna eat you, ha ha, bro, I'm gonna eat, I'm gonna eat you. And Simon's like, nah, no, you're not. And so he manages to pick up a cross, right? And Omar Epps just looks at him and goes, sorry, sport, I'm an atheist. And Simon pushes a button on the cross and like a blade shoots out of it. And he looks at him, he goes, God loves you anyway. And he stabs him in the eye. <gasps> Selena then is the one who comes to fight Simon, but Simon is unable to kill her, and he and Van Helsing are forced to flee as police arrive. Okay. So, Simp Simon. She calls him Simple Simon, but he's just a simp. Simon is unable to kill Selena, and he and Van Helsing drive off into the sunrise. So, Simon stops the car and demands that Van Helsing tell him what the heck is going on. Like, what is wrong with Selena? What happened? What aren't you telling me? So Van Helsing gives us the explanation. We flash back to 1879 where he traps Dracula. And this is actually really clever. He sets up a mirror in an alleyway. So Dracula is walking down this alley and he doesn't know that it ends because he can't see his own reflection. So he like stops like sensing the thing in front of him and he like cracks the mirror and it breaks and it's like a cage wall and then the other wall swings down and locks him in. I actually really like it and it'll be used again later in the movie in like a reverse way. It's, it's great. So Dracula is captured and Van Helsing says that he has tried everything he can to kill Dracula but the things that seem to kill other vampires don't work on Dracula. Van Helsing says that he was the first, he was the originator of vampires, he's the oldest, he doesn't even know how old he truly is. He just knows that everything, sunlight, stake through the heart, everything that would kill a vampire doesn't work on Dracula. But he is averse to all things, they, they say all things Christian. He's averse to the cross, to holy water, the Bible, you know, Catholic grandmas, I don't know. Van Helsing also reveals that he is the original Van Helsing. He is the Abraham Van Helsing. And he has been staying alive throughout the century to keep an eye on Dracula by using leeches to suck out Dracula's blood, filter the blood, and then he injects himself with the blood inside of the leeches. It makes sense when you see it. So. Van Helsing filters Dracula's blood through these leeches, and that's why Dracula was covered in leeches in his coffin. He filters the blood and then he sucks it out of the leeches and injects it into himself. So, And we've been seeing that in little hints and bits throughout the movie, we just never knew why really. So he's staying alive but he's not getting any of the vampire symptoms. Which honestly just really ticks Drac off. He's like, that's rude, you could at least, you know, be my minion or something. But this is also why Dracula is in New Orleans looking for Mary. Mary is revealed to be Van Helsing's daughter. Now, because she is born after Van Helsing has been surviving off of this vampire blood, it's, it's in him, it's part of him, now that DNA is passed on to Mary. So Dracula feels like this, th that's why they have like a psychic bond, that is why Dracula is so drawn to her, is because he um, he can feel his blood in her. And he goes on later to state that he has been searching for centuries for a vampire that was born and not made. So more than just having like this psychic sexual connection with Mary, he is, he's been searching for somebody like her for years. 
We also get a scene uh, after Selena is rescued by the police arriving at the town hall. She's taken to the police station and this scene is one of my favorites because she's like doing like levitating kind of things and like being a weird vampire lady in this interrogation room to this detective and this doctor and Dracula shows up and Selena eats the detective and then Dracula backs the doctor into a corner and the doctor goes to scream and Dracula goes shh dignity doctor and then just eats him it's so this movie is so funny Simon and Van Helsing decide to split up and go look for Mary um Simon goes to her work at the Virgin store and Van Helsing is gonna go to her house and search for her. Unfortunately, Dracula gets to the Virgin store before them, but Mary isn't there. He runs into Lucy instead. Lucy says Mary isn't here, but she may have gone back to her house, so uh, let me walk you home. And I just still can't get over that they work at the friggin' Virgin store. So Dracula and Lucy go to the house. We get just this movie. Lucy invites him in. <sighs> He's so sassy. Lucy invites him in and she's telling him this stuff about Mary and her mother and how, you know, after her mom died, we had to decorate the, we had to redecorate the house because it felt a little, <laughs> it felt a little Catholic. Yeah. <laughs> So Mary isn't home, but Lucy invites him to stay for coffee, and Drac, I never drink coffee. <laughs> if, you, if you don't know why that's so funny, go watch all of my other Dracula reviews, because in every single freaking, every single Dracula movie, I never drink wine <laughs> oh this movie is so much fun i adore it i adore this movie oh man <laughs> okay dracula doesn't drink coffee but he sure does like to drink the blood of young blonde girls so they get all up on each other there's some weird floating spinning sex and then Lucy becomes bride number three. Van Helsing arrives at the house shortly after. And it's, I mean, it's not a good thing. He arrives at the house and he's walking down the hall to the upstairs bedroom and there's a big mirror at the end of the hall. And he's walking down the hall and all of a sudden he stops. And he turns around and Dracula's behind him and Drax, Drac, I can't remember the exact line, but it's basically, hey, it sucks to be tricked by your own reflection, don't it? Flashback, mother effer. And he picks him up and he like throws him into the mirror, which again, don't do that. He's Christopher, he's so old, leave him alone. <laughs> he's been alive an annoyingly long time. So they get Van Helsing. And then we flash back to the virgin store. <laughs> Mary shows up looking for Lucy because she's had another vision of Dracula and he she saw him getting all up on Lucy. So she's there at the store looking for her. And a coworker says she's gone home. She's, you know, she's not here. Simon shows up at the same time and tries to talk to Mary. He's like, hey, look, I'm here with your dad. You're in trouble. We need to get you out of here. And she's like, bro, I've had a bad day. Leave me alone. I don't know you. And I don't want to talk about my dad. Leave me alone. <laughs> Simon follows her out to this loading dock and Mary ditches him because why listen to the man who tells you you're in danger? Okay, but Omar Epps pops back up and we get an awesome little fight between Simon and Omar Epps in this loading dock. <sighs> I love Omar Epps in this because he's just, he just, Honestly, he seriously looks like he's having so much fun just getting to be a vampire and like hiss and show his fangs and have red eyes and like throw people around and 
mm, say witty witty vampire phrases it's so much fun i love him in this um simon tries to say a badass line it's okay um and then he just like clean sweeps omar epps's head off his shoulders like he is so done with vampires tonight and i don't blame him he is getting thrown around into virgin mobiles and like kicked into dumpsters it's a bad time for the guy so he just like it's so done and we have to say goodbye to omar epps <laughs> <laughs> it's fine mary gets home and she goes to her room which is on the bottom floor and all the all the weird vampire stuff took place upstairs so she goes into her room and she gets a call on the phone the call is coming from inside the house <laughs> and it's lucy and she says i'm upstairs with your dad and so mary is like uh, sus gross it's not girls gone wild season yet calm down so she goes upstairs and she goes into Lucy's room and it's like all torn up and there are like lumps under Mary's cover or Mary's there are like lumps under Lucy's covers and so Mary pulls back the cover and I think it's one of the bed posts or like a curtain rod is like shoved through the bed and there's like blood everywhere and so Mary gets on her knees and looks under the bed and poor Christopher Plummer has just been hang hate shanked through the bed, through the throat. He is just gonzo. He is, is so aggressively, he's so aggressively dead. And Mary's still like, father, father. Uh, girl, he dead. You're a virgin, not a moron. But Mary tries to get away and she's like accosted by all three brides because they're all like collected now and there's like crawling on the wall and the ceiling and then Dracula appears and he like tries to chase her down and he like turns into a wolf. It's fantastic actually. Uh, we love that. And she runs outside just as Simon arrives and he like, she like, like falls into his arms and he like twists and like shoots a crossbow bolt into the into the wolf and it like explodes into bats in early 2000 CGI. <laughs> Simon gives Mary the lowdown on what's going on and that she shares blood with Dracula and that her dad is 175 years old and everything's bad. And so they, they find like a seminary, um, like a Catholic seminary and they go there to kind of hide out and try to learn more about Dracula because we need to have a research scene. So they're studying and at Mary's house, there was something written on the wall in Aramaic. And when she sees the, the same kind of letters in one of the books at the seminary, she starts to remember. And Simon's like, whoa, you know, you, you know Aramaic? And she's like, no, but Drac does. The message that Dracula had written on the wall was, believe in me for I am the way to eternity. They're also trying to figure out why Dracula has such an aversion to, to, to Christian symbols. Especially where the silver is concerned, because silver is not a uniquely Christian thing. Dracula, for some reason, is not turned off at all by the seminary, and so he just, like, strolls in. And poor Simon is useless and gets, like, thrown around again. He's gonna need a chiropractor after this movie. Poor baby. <laughs> so... He tries to get Drac away, but Drac ends up catching up with Mary and he like s sweeps her away somewhere. So Simon follows and the brides actually like lead him to where Mary and Dracula are just so they can try to eat him. So Simon ends up having to fight off the brides and he kills bride number two, the TV reporter bride good riddance. So we go to Mary and Dracula who are standing on the roof and there's this big huge like light up cross that has a picture of, of, of Jesus on it and Dracula just starts to tell Mary like who he is and why he is because it's that time of the movie 
And so he bites her and we had this like dream montage flashback scene. Dracula has been saying through the movie and he and a couple of other people have said that he has been known by many names throughout history. And if they can figure out who he was originally, they might be able to find a way to stop him. It turns out that Dracula was originally Judas Iscariot, the man from the Bible who betrayed Christ. Now in the Bible, Judas hangs himself after betraying Christ, after he was paid his 30 pieces of silver. However, the rope broke and he was cursed to walk the earth forever. Now, this explains his aversion to all Christian holy symbols, as well as his aversion to silver due to the 30 pieces of silver that he was paid to betray Christ. Dracula now uses his immortality to steal the lives of Christ's children to... Uh, he says something along the lines of, I, I live on the blood of your children and I give them all the pleasure that you would deny them. But at what cost? You know, at the cost of their free will, because, you know, they're not themselves afterwards. And this was the thing that Mary was fearing throughout the whole movie. It wasn't sex, because Lucy mentions that Mary used to have a wild side, she used to go out and party, all this kind of stuff. But it's the loss of control that Dracula puts over her that she fears. So Simon is captured by Lucy and Selena, and Mary is the one who gets to bite him. Now that Dracula has bitten her, she's a vampire now, so Mary gets to munch on Simon. Sounds like a fair deal. You know, fair is fair. So, Simon tries to talk her down and it doesn't work. So Mary gets all up on Simon and leaves him bloody. And then she tells Dracula that she wants his head. And Drac, he's kind of smelling a little bit of sus. Like, he's got this look on his face like, okay, this is going a little too smoothly. How much longer of the movie do we have? Yeah, this is way, going way too smoothly. But sure, take his head off. And so she grabs this big old long knife that Simon brought, and she goes to like cut his head off, but Lucy notices that Simon wasn't bitten. He's just got blood on his neck, but it's too late because Mary swipes her head off. And then she like swipes her head off and then like spins around and like shanks Dracula with it. And she's like, that's for my dad, you loser. And she like tries to like eviscerate him, but he's a vampire and he's really strong. And then it's up to Simon to take on Selena, Mary to take on Dracula. And we get lots of awesome vampire action, especially now that Mary's a vampire. So we've got vampire on vampire action and vampire on human action. Fun all the way around. Go check out the movie. It's great. Simon ends up getting the upper hand on Selena with a pair of garden shears. And I love because like he's got her neck between the garden shears and she's like, Simon, you and I, we and he just like cuts her head off. He's like, he's so over Selena right now. He's like, girl, I might as well be gay now, okay? Go away. <laughs> and Dracula is still fighting with Mary. And he's like, didn't your dad tell you I can't die, okay? You can't kill me. He won't have me. And Mary's like, well, have you asked? He's like, what, for forgiveness? Uh, no, dumb. So... He gets Mary to the edge of the roof and he's about to throw her over when she grabs this like cable that's hanging off of the giant, you remember the giant blingy cross? She grabs the cable that's hanging off of that and wraps it around his neck and then like throws both of them over the edge of the roof and it hangs him and the cross like falls and is leaning against the edge of the roof and he like looks up and this picture of Jesus on the cross is just looking down at him. <laughs> do I laugh or do I like shudder? Is it funny or is it profound? It's a bit of both. Hands down, it's the best Dracula death in any movie. I don't care, this is the best. Mary falls and lays on the ground and Dracula decides to release his control on her and the sun rises, he burns to death while hanging off this roof 
from the cross and it seems to work. We get a little ending narration from Mary and she says that, you know, thousands of years ago Judas Iscariot tried to kill himself to atone for his sins but it didn't work. This time the rope didn't break. So she compiled his ashes and now she is back in London. She is now taking care of the coffin, making sure that no one can ever access Dracula again if there is still even a flicker of, of him remaining. She is there to make sure that it's never released again. And that's Dracula 2000! One of the funnest, strangest, oddest, but most enjoyable Dracula movies that I have ever seen. I highly recommend this movie. It is a ton, a ton, a ton of fun. Great vampire action, great acting. But why am I covering it now and not back when I was doing my Dracula-a-thon? Well, the first reason is pretty clear. It's a, it's, a, it's a sequel. It's a continuation of Dracula. The other reason is because of this very interesting religious perspective that it puts on to Dracula. In this, Dracula is Judas Iscariot. He is a man from the Bible. He is probably the most loathed man in Christianity. And using that identity to tie in all of the reasons that Christian symbolism is effective to vampires is actually a really great idea. And this isn't the only movie that does that. It's also interesting that the symbols that affect Dracula so heavily don't seem to have an effect on his baby vampires. I mean, Omar Epps is not repulsed by the cross. Even Selena doesn't seem to mind it. So it's it's interesting that the things that affect the master vampire doesn't affect all of the subsequent other vampires. We also get some interesting religious tie-ins with both Simon, who was one of Christ's disciples and one of his most devoted, and the Virgin Mary who works at Virgin Store. Did you get that she's supposed to be Mary and a virgin and possibly the Virgin Mary? It's also interesting that after Christ was resurrected, Mary Magdalene was the first person that he revealed himself to as a resurrected being. And Mary is the only person that Dracula has ever shared his real identity with. So there's an interesting tie-in there with Mary being both the first to know Christ was resurrected and the first to know that Judas was resurrected. This movie also had some fun, fun tie-ins with the book. It even mentioned that the book existed in that universe, inspired by the true story of Dracula and Van Helsing. Um, they mentioned it a couple of times, but Dracula's powers turning into mist, summoning storms, turning into wolves and bats is all in this movie. Um, when the plane crashes, the pilot is found like tied to the, tied to his chair with like pipes and wires. Amazing tie-ins, so much fun. I cannot recommend this movie enough. Is it corny? Is it cheesy? Yes. Is it unintentionally hilarious in parts? Yes. Does some parts of it not make any sense? Yes. But does that matter? No, because it's a good time. I love this movie. It's probably honestly in my top 10 favorite vampire movies. So make sure you check it out. Show this movie some love because it's not getting enough of it. Thank you guys so, so much for hanging out with me today. I have a blast talking about these movies and thank you for being so patient with these updates that the channel has been going through. Until next time, bye guys.